so glad to see you. Good morning to everybody. I'm glad you're here. It's your, if, it's, if it's your first time here at Elevate, I'd like to welcome you. My name is Brandon. I'm the lead pastor here. My wife, Kristen, and I, I think she's serving somewhere in the nursery, so y'all got to connect with her a little bit later. But we're so glad to have you guys here, and we're honored. I'm glad to have a good time. I'm excited about, I had a great week. Did anybody have a great week? Uh, a great weekend? I mean, come on, my Aggies won, all right? LSU lost. That's a great weekend right there. Now we just need the Texans to win the day, right? Come on, somebody. If you're new here, know this is a Texan house, not a cowgirl house. Just so you know, all right? But uh, anyway, we love sports, man, and we love having a good time. I'm excited about starting this new series called Echo. Really, when it gets down to it, there's nothing more important in life than our mission, that's to echo his name, echo his voice, and up to his mission. Amen? So if you will, we're going to go ahead and get started. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 19 and Acts chapter 15. That's where I'm going to be hanging out today. 1 Kings 19 and Acts chapter 15. And uh, if you don't know, if it's your first time, every, every single one of you in your seats, you have some sermon notes right there. And you can pull those out and follow along with us if you'd like. We even got some really cool little black books that you can, uh, they cost six bucks, but that's exactly what we pay for, I promise. <laughs> we ain't trying to make money on the little black books, okay? But the little black books allows you to keep that organized and stay in, uh, in tune with what we do with this series. Uh, today, my uh, sermon title is real easy, and it kind of relates to the title of it, don't it? Keep it simple. Keep it Jesus. Somebody say that with me. Keep it simple. Keep it Jesus. All right. And um, you know, every single year, my uh, my father's been doing it for many years. But every for the past seven years, I've been able to travel with him, which I've been very excited about. That is, uh, every year we go to the Super Bowl, and we don't go to the actual game. But what we do is we go we go the week before, and we interview all the Christian athletes. And we hold a, a service on TVN every Friday uh, before the Super, every Friday before the Super Bowl Sunday, and it's really neat to go there and hear the men not only talk about the game of football, but they talk about the game of life, and it's it's really cool to hear their testimonies and their stories and how even though the game of football has made them famous, what they want to do is make Jesus famous. All right, it, it's really neat to see that, but I'll never forget that I've heard it every year. But it really hit me the year that, uh, if y'all remember, when New England played the New York Giants. So, yeah, oh, we, yeah, that's all right. It's cool. We got a special altar call for you at the end. Uh, it's, it's all right. So I'm glad to know that up front. Now I know how to direct this message. I didn't know how God was going to point it. I didn't know where the Holy Spirit was leading me, but now I know. You know? No. But, yeah, but you remember the year when the, when the Patriots, right, they were undefeated, right, going into the Super Bowl. And they were going in to face the New York Giants, right? And so everybody thought that there's no way New England's going to lose. But I remember hearing that obviously New England, they just had it going on, right? They knew exactly what they were doing. But I, re I remember hearing this question. Coach, they asked both, uh, both coaches, uh, both head coaches, hey, coach, well, here you are going into the biggest game of your life. What is it you're going to do different? And it shocked me what he said. He actually said something that I did not expect. He said, it's real easy. We're going to go back to the fundamentals. And I was like, what? And if you don't know anything about football, uh, you're going to get to know a little bit about this morning, OK? I, Jesus loves football, so we're going to talk about football, all right? But, but the thing is, if you've never played football before, when you start off a season, uh, you start your practices two a days or three a days or whatever it may be, however, whatever the coach decides, I guess, that day, right? But, but you go into it, and the first part of your practice is all fundamentals. Majority, it's all fundamentals, the basics of football. And then you go into the game plan kind of the second half of the season. Now, the more that the season continues on, the less there is in the fundamental session, usually you have a two-hour uh, session for practice every day, you find more that the season goes on, there's less fundamentals and there's more focus on the game plan. That's just the way that it happens. So you would think, right, that here you got two teams going into the biggest game of their life, that they would actually focus more on the game plan, right? That would make sense. But it struck me how they said going into the biggest game of our life, we actually went back to 
the fundamentals. They went back to the basics. Somebody say back to the basics. And, and, and then I begin thinking about it, is that great coaches and great leaders, they will always push you to the goal, right? But they will never forget and they're never afraid to go back to the basics. A great coach and a great leader, they will push you to excel to the next level, a next level, but they'll grow your foundation, uh, they'll grow your foundation stronger within the process, right? And so I sometimes think that we can get so caught up in everything around us going on that we forget about the basic fundamentals of Jesus. And we forget about the basic name, and that's him echoing his name. In other words, we live in a very complex society, don't we? Uh, for example, I hate math. If I got any fans out there with me, come on, that's a good place for the audience how they've been. How many hate math? Yeah, all right, come on, I'm with you, right? I hate math it, it, with the passion. But, then, but the other thing is, I can't spell real good. So when you try to throw out this thing like algebra, man, when they put numbers and letters together, man, I'm lost. Anybody else with me, right? I hate algebra. Hey, come on, don't you just want to say, hey, just keep it simple. Let numbers be numbers and let letters be letters. Anybody with me in the house, yeah? Uh, keep it simple, man, right? But you know what? I begin to think about it. The greatest minds in the world that put together all those formulas, that put together algebra, like Albert Einstein and others, None of them would ever have been able to revolutionize this world if they hadn't first learned their ABCs and their one, two, threes. Uh, there's something about the fundamentals and the basics of life that gets us to do and push what God has called us to do, amen? In fact, the, I think the reason why most of us fall into temptation is because we forget about the fundamental things of life and when things get crazy, we start doing things we've never done before. In other words, you start doing what you want to do instead of doing what he's called you to do. Uh, here we are praying, God, man, I'm in this situation. Give me new revelation. Give me new revelation, God. I, I just need to move with this. He said, why should I give you new revelation when you've already forgot the revelation that I've already given you? Uh, get back to the fundamentals. Get back to the basics. Somebody say, get back to the basics. Yeah. Talking about keeping it simple. Keeping it Jesus and echoing his name. Uh, Jesus had a three-year ministry. And the majority of what he taught, if you go back and study it, were the basic fundamentals that every person needs to know. He had a three-year ministry. And within those three years, Jesus preached on hell 33 times in the Bible. He preached on hell about once a month. Many of us would not even want him to go to his church. And he gets real to it. But why did he preach on that? Because he knew that the bottom line, the fundamental message of Jesus that he's trying to preach was to get them to know me and to echo my name so that others can get to know me too. Uh, because he wants you to understand, he wanted people to understand that before anything can take place, you've got to know that there is a heaven and that there is a hell and the only way to the Father is through me. Uh, he, apparently, if that's what he focused on the most in his ministry, there's something we can learn from Jesus about getting back to the fundamentals. When it comes to echoing his name. Faith in God seems complicated today, right? Religion and denomination is even more complicated. So complicated that we often avoid the conversation and the discussion. I'll never forget when I was coming out of a youth camp one time, a youth retreat, and I just got saved like 20,000 times. I mean, y'all get saved like 20,000 times when you go on a youth camp, right? And so I came back and I just, I'll just never forget my dad telling me. He said, son, he said, live to be a 95% Christian. Like, what? I just came back from you kids saying I need to go 110 for Jesus. You know, t shirt and everything. Right? Go for Jesus, right? And I was like, what are you talking about? And he told me, he said, so when you put everybody together, all denominations, all beliefs, and everything, is that we agree on 95% of everything, but we let that 5% divide us all. Strive to live to be a 95% Christian. Love God, love people, no matter where they come from, and echo his name. Amen? Amen. Uh, I challenge you, uh, live to be a 95% Christian. We're in this thing together, and it's called life. 
Uh, we have multiple translations in the Bible to make it easier for us to understand the thousands, loaves, and we. I'm being thankful for the message translation. Amen. Come on, right? I love it. But there were those not long after Jesus who tried to attach rules and requirements to the original message that he brought. Uh, humans love to set up poops for others to jump through, right? You, you got to do this, and you got to do this uh, according to this denomination or this belief, and then you can be a believer. Man, no, it's real simple. It's like we had to take the simple gut message of what Jesus brought, and we just had to make it more complicated. It's real simple. If you just believe in Jesus, everything's going to be okay, right? Yeah, just this a month we did a house come on with. Yeah, shout out. <laughs> you know, for like, keeping it simple, how many believe? That God intended for us to all be fit, be in shape, right? Oh, hello, right? I'll be fit in shape. Y'all still with me? Okay. In fact, my wife tells me, honey, you know you were born with a six pack. I'm like, yeah, I know, baby. I just got a nice fridge around it, you know? It's that. But my wife and I were kind of on this organic, natural kick, and, and we. We love to, we love to eat the natural food. We believe just, you know, eat it the way God created it. And when we applied it, we lost tons of weight and, and, uh, and, uh, and things went well. And then, but, you know, we just get sometimes frustrated. You know, the food industry, y'all probably seen it, right? Food industry loves to just pump and inject all these different things into the food. Used to, you take 90 days to grow a chicken. Now they can do it in like four weeks. I, I'm not Einstein, but something's wrong. You know? They added something to the chicken, right? And so uh, you don't supposed to put out that many eggs that quick, chicken. All right, so, so but that's but some I would believe that that's kind of the reason, you know, why we suffer with obesity in our country. But sometimes we just want to say, man, can't you just keep it simple, right? You know, let food be food and just let it be that, all right? Anybody with me? Except for bluebell. Whatever they're doing to bluebell, just leave it alone, right? Come on. Anybody with me and crave cupcakes? Oh Jesus. It's like eating a baby angel. Oh man. So good, right? How many of you love bluebell? You love crepe cupcakes. Yeah, yeah. But the sprinkle fans in the house, if you say you're a sprinkle fan, that's like saying you're a cowboy fan. What's up with that? I just called you out. Alright, so anyway, I right, so so let's keep this up with bluebell. Alright, go. Alright. Here's my point. Is that humans over the past two thousand years have attached customs, traditions, rules, wars. Denominations, nations, discriminations, doctrines, politics, to the simple message that Jesus brought to us. Uh, but what I'm here to do today is just basically coach you back to the basics and get you back to the original revelation, right? That he's the same God that was the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? And he's taking care of yesterday, he's in charge of today, and he's had tomorrow plans since the beginning of time, so get happy, everything's going to be alright. You have a revelation that you can hold on to. And just get back to the basics of Jesus. Things are going to work out. Let's quit worrying about how bad life is. Because God created it good, peaceful, fruitful. He created us to live a blessed life. How many want to live a blessed life? The way you pursue the blesser, you get the blessing, right? I want a blessed life. But in Genesis 1, verse 27, it says God created human beings. He created them God, uh, reflecting God's nature, and he blessed them to prosper. And you know, many men, many religions and denominations will try to, tr to, to switch and trip you up from the original message that God is telling you you're supposed to be blessed. Because they say, hey, that was in the old covenant. And that, that, that was for Adam, and when he fell, that was then. That's not for us. We're supposed to suffer for Jesus, you know? Uh, that we're supposed to live a blessed life, amen? That, that's just the way we're supposed to live. So for all the religious uh, folk in the house or anybody listening, here's what it says in the New Testament, okay? It's like, I'm firing one right back at you, okay? Here it is, Romans 5, 18 says the best of the message. Here it is in a nutshell. Just as one person did it wrong and got us, out, got us in all this trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us out of it. But more than just getting us out of trouble, he got us into life. One man said no to God and put many in the wrong, but one man said yes to God and he put many in the right. Ain't that good news? Amen? We're thankful for a man named Jesus that was willing to come and make it right. Yeah, things may have been gone wrong at one time, but we serve a man who makes everything right. Uh, that's why I live 
by going back to the basics, and that's loving God, loving people, and echoing his name. That's what it comes down to. Quit making life so hard. And where it changes everything, and it changes from what you believe. Just keep the simple truth and be like Jesus. Right? And be like Jesus. And there's there's four points that I want to go over with you real quick, and it's in your notes. <laughs> Is that I believe in order for us to have the strength to go out in our workplace, to go out in our schools, to go out within our homes, to have the strength to just to go out and echo the name of Jesus, that there's some four basic principles and fundamentals that we must live by every single day. And if we don't apply these four fundamental principles in our lives, then I think we lose the power of going out and echoing the name of Jesus, all right? Number one is this. It's in your notes. Keep on dreaming. Keep on dreaming. Don't let your current situation keep you from dreaming. Stay faithful to God, and he will stay faithful to you. Uh, Moses, he had a passion to free the people out of Egypt and slavery, but he did it in the wrong way. He found out he had a passion to free people, but he went and he took a soldier's life, and because he made a mistake, what did he do? He ran from his passion, and he ran from his calling. And so he went and he tended the sheep of his father-in-law for 40 years. And I believe, and then after 40 years, God called him and said, hey, rekindle that passion, and he went back to free the people of Egypt. But what I believe is that I don't think within those 40 years that God wasn't speaking. I believe those 40 years of him running from his dream, from him running of echoing his name, I believe that at least every week or every month or just whenever it was needed, I believe God went knocking on Moses' door and said, hey, don't forget what I called you to do. And so in other words, you find in this story with Moses, you find an analogy or a phrase that we've all heard that there's, uh, it's called seed, time, and harvest, right? Y'all heard that phrase? There's seed, there's time, and there's harvest. In other words, the farmer is always in control of the seed. And he's always in control of collecting the harvest. But what he's never in control is, is the time. He's never in control of the time. It's easy to plant and it's easy to collect, but how many would agree it's very hard to wait? Right? It's very hard. Look at this. Boom. There we go. It's very hard to wait, right? In other words, I don't know about y'all, but I hate to wait. I'm a very, I'm like, let's get it done, man. Let's make it happen. That's just me. But then I began to learn that the Bible talks about passionate patience. If you can develop this character within you to be passionate about what he's called you to do in the time, then you're getting somewhere. You'll get to the harvest. But then we all, we all face this point to where we're driven to a point where the devil likes to work. They say, well, I actually drive you to the point of either you want it all or you don't want it at all. And you, and you fall into this danger zone of what I like to call the net effect. It would be good for you to write that down, the net effect. And the net effect is simply this. The net effect is when the devil can't catch you by slipping into sin, he will try to catch you by influencing you not to fulfill the potential in what God has called you to do. It is equally as effective. And if he can get you to stop serving people, he can get you to stop serving God. In the midst of the process, the greatest thing that you've got going on before you is staying in relationship. Staying in relationship with God and the church, which is people. We believe here at Elevate that if you want to grow closer with God, you must grow closer with people. Because it's all about relationship. Somebody turn to your name and say it's all about relationship. It's all about relationship. If you stop the relationship, <laughs> then you fall in into the net effect. And in other words, instead of you being the one that's casting the net, you're now the one that is caught in the net. And it's dangerous because we're called to catch. We're called to reach people. We're called to echo his name. Echo his name in our family. Echo his name in our marriage. Echo his name in our job, in our schools. Uh, I believe the net effect is best described in 1 Kings chapter 19. You can look in your Bibles. I just want to encourage everybody. Maybe I'm a little old school. I'm, I'm the most technology-driven fool in the world. 
I got it. I got an iPhone, iPad, iBook. And all, I'm not getting the mini pad. I don't get that. But uh, but, but I got it all. But I'm, there's just something a little old school about me, man. That said, bring your Bible. All right. And there's something about bringing your Bible to church. It's like not taking your car keys to your car, right? Like, how do you expect to get anywhere without the Word of God? Amen. So I challenge you, bring your Bibles to church. But look at First Kings chapter 19. Uh, talking about the net effect. We're talking about Elijah. Now, before I actually read this passage, I want you to understand something about Elijah. That what just happened before the passage that we're about to read is that uh, God performed many miracles in Elijah's life and the calling that he had done. In other words, he had seen God move. And how we, you know how we're just talking about where in Moses' journey and the time that we're waiting, that God will just sometimes he'll just send you something that keeps you hanging on. Y'all with me? Y'all been there, right? You believe for something and then something happens and it keeps you hanging on. You want to keep believing in it. And Elijah, it's obvious he had God on his side. Right before we were about to read what we're about to read, he just got done calling fire down from heaven. He just got done calling rain down from heaven. He just outran a chariot on foot. Who outruns a horse? It's obvious God is on his side, right? I mean, God is on his side, but what I'm going to read to you, and I want to see if you catch it when I read it in the Bible, is that he separated himself from relationship. He just got done calling heaven on down. He has no doubt that God is on his side. But there's a moment where he separates himself from relationship. <laughs> He was driven to the point of suicide. Uh, look at look at First Kings verse nineteen, starting it's verse one through four. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, which is calling down fire from heaven, all the miracles, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah: "May the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you, Elijah, just as you have killed them." Verse 3, Elijah was afraid, and he fled for his life. He went to Ber mm -hmm. Beersheba, thank you, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on, what does it say? Alone, into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I'm no better than any ancestors who have already died. Now, come on, man. You just saw fire come from heaven. And you're worried about a threat from this lady? Something's missing, right? So, so in other words, what I believe is that I don't think that the reason why he wanted to take his life was because of the belief that God wouldn't work for him on his behalf. But it was because he separated himself from relationship. Well, the moment you try to do it on your own, you're not going to make it. And I believe what God is trying to say is that, is that, you see, when the devil can't kill you through the temptation of drugs, alcohol, or any kind of addiction, what is equally more effective is detouring you off of the pursuit of the dream that he's called you to do and break you off relationship with him. It is equally as important where you don't drink. In other words, Elijah's story, what it proves and what it shows is that God is not as much interested in miracles and prophecies and moves happening in the church as much as he is about helping people finding and keeping a relationship with him. Yeah, no, don't get me wrong. I'm a big believer in everything in the Holy Spirit. I know that God's going to move, man. Miracles are going to take place, amen? Prophecy's going to be given. There's going to be moments when the Holy Spirit moves. But when it comes down to it, the number one thing is about souls. It's all about souls. Somebody say it's all about souls. It's all about souls. It's all about helping people find a relationship with Jesus. If you can find Jesus, then you get all of Jesus. And I just want you to know that we must understand this thing. That when you keep your relationship with Jesus, you'll have the strength to keep on dreaming. Which means, if you keep on dreaming, you're echoing his name. And the way we echo his name is to keep on dreaming. And our dream is to reach people. Is to reach a family. They don't know Jesus. Reach your kids. They can see the Jesus in you, dads. They can see the Jesus in you, moms. Keep on dreaming. Everybody say, keep on dreaming. Keep on dreaming. Second point is this. You be you. I am who I am, and I is who I is. Y'all help me out a little bit. I am who I am. Throw a little 
bonnets on y'all, y'all can't get it, man, what's up? Don't let people, this world, denomination, religion, try and change you or challenge you from who you were born to be. You are a child of God. And keep it simple and be like Jesus. In other words, my challenge to you is this, is that there's a lot of people in this world, everybody was born an original. But most of us will die a copy. Here you are. Yeah, everybody is born in original. He said he set you apart in Jeremiah, right? If he didn't need you, he wouldn't have sent you. So he set you apart for a reason. So why try to change what he's called you to be? Here we are. Most of us are born in original, but most of us die a copy. We take on the copy of the world. We take on the copy of denomination. We take on the copy of racism. We take on the copy of everything that you can think of, but get back to being who God called you to be. You be you and don't let nobody try to change you. First, one of the first things that our team, uh, they've heard from me, especially our worship pastor Marcus, and I've told many of the others, is that, hey, you better believe on what you hear for your gifts and your talents. Yeah, you better believe it, man. But if you come, you never play a note, and you never sing a song, I want you to know I want you for you. So I'm challenging you. Get around people that want you for you and not what you can do for them. And don't be afraid to be you. You be you. Keep it simple. Be like Jesus. God gave you gifts and talents to use in this world, and they use those to glorify him and not the world. But people have different titles that the world tries to label, but there's only one title that I care about, and that's to be a son of Jesus. Amen? That's what all we should care about. I want to read to you a passage in Acts chapter 15 to where we find the original gospel of Jesus being twisted and turned from... They, 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 it, it's the original message of Jesus. They try to twist it and turn it. And then Peter comes in and he just puts them in check and he gives them a reality check. So, hey, let's get back to the simple truth. Get back to the basics. It says in Acts 15, starting with verse 7, I believe it's in the NIV version is what it's described best. Or at least that's what I have. After much discussion, Peter got up and he addressed them. Your brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. In other words, it worked just for you, dude, so don't try to twist it to fit what you want. Uh, go back to what it originally said, and it says this. God know, who knows the heart, we're talking about a God who knows the heart, and he showed that because he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. In other words, it wasn't just for the day of Pentecost. It wasn't just for us. You don't have serve, we don't serve a God to where he gives you something just for you. He always uses you as something that can be passed through onto others. So you know, everything he brings to this world is for us and for other people. He says he did not discriminate between us and them. There is no race. There is no color. We, just, we come, we all bleed red. Amen, right? It's just all about doing this together. For he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither me nor your ancestor have been, able, have been able to bear? In other words, why are you trying to change the simple message of Jesus? And this is what the simple message of Jesus is. Is that we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as we are. Amen. How many are thankful that we serve a God who shows enough grace that he loves us just for who we are? Amen. Amen. And you be you. Jesus loves you. And you be you. Number three. Love God and love people. It is important if we want to echo the name of Jesus effectively. We must take on the principle to love God and to love people. In other words, quit making, keep life simple. Uh, quit letting situations and old events cause you to treat each other and people that you know bad. How many of you understand the concept that hurt people hurt people, right? Uh, we hurt each other. So you can see, you can, you see the need to ask yourself a question. And we ask ourselves this at Elevate Church that if we're truly loving God and loving people, 
And if we're not attracting the people that Jesus attracted, then we're not preaching what Jesus preached. Come on. And so if you really want to echo the name of Jesus, then you're going to preach what he preached. But a good way to tell if you're not doing it is if you're not attracting the people that he attracted. In other words, church is about for anybody and everybody, no matter the background and no matter how many times we've been stuck on stupid, right? We've been stuck on stupid a lot. Anybody confess to that? Amen? Amen. Right. Uh, in other words, there's a simple value that I think we all should understand. That life is all about relationships. And you must be able to love the person more than the situation. Do you love the person more than the situation? There's been people in my life that have hurt me, and I've hurt them. There's been people in my life that use you, and they do you wrong. I got a phone call last week. Somebody just literally cussing me out, called me the biggest thing, and phony. And they weren't man enough to leave the name, but they left the message, you know. But, but they were just, just grinding, man, people are going to hurt you. People are going to do you wrong. But the quicker that you can get the revelation that life is all about relationships and you must learn to value the person more than what they've done to you or more than the situations that they've created in your life, until you can do that, you will never begin to understand the love that your father has for you. Amen. It's just really that simple. When you start to love people the way that God loves people, it will help you understand how much he loves you. Uh, life is about loving people and loving God, just like Jesus. So here's the challenge. Echo his name and echo his love. If his love is unconditional for you, and we take on the image of Jesus, then we should do the same thing for others. And I know it's family. Sometimes family ticks you off and you don't get out of here. I'm going to talk to you forever. The Bible says you got to love them. I don't mean you got to like them. <laughs> All right? Bill is supposed to love people. Love the person, not the situation. Last thing is this, as we close. Is keep fighting. Keep fighting. It's okay when things get rough sometimes, but we gotta quit letting doubt and fear grip you and control you. And there's people in the Bible that I believe we can learn from that struggled with this. Is that here you are, you're supposed to echo the name, you're supposed to carry out the dream that God has called you to do. But we get in situations, we just want to give up, right? And we don't know that, that situation, and I believe there's a couple of people that we can learn after and learn from. And if I can, sometimes when I read the Bible, I just kind of like to use my holy imagination, if that's all right, okay? Just to kind of share a story. But we all know the story of David and when he was fighting Goliath, right? And the Bible says that he, he went and he reached down and he got one stone, right? So he reached down and he got a stone and he looked up and what did he do? He went and got four more. Because I believe whenever he grabbed that one, he looked up and went, oh, snap. <laughs> that dude big. You know, he, he was born on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. You know? That jack, whoo. And he's ugly too, you know? So ugly, had a trick or treat by telephone, man. That's ugly, but... So, so, so I believe, man, he's just like, man, I don't know if I can make this happen. And so he reached down just like we all do. Uh, when we hit down and we hit fear, we reach down and try to grab some more that's going to give us an advantage. But you see, the moment that you try to create the advantage, instead of letting him be the advantage, well, you, you will lose the effort to fight. And, but David realized that he realized that it doesn't matter how many stones that I grab, he was going, he was thinking in the flesh, right? He was grabbing more, but then it hit him. Then who, how dare you talk about my God that way? And then all of a sudden, his faith rose up inside of him, and, and he went back to the basics of believing in his God, and he knew that it didn't matter the size of the giant, it doesn't matter the size of the enemy, it doesn't matter the history of what they've done, all the wins that they have, but he serves a man who holds the win, and he holds the keys, amen? And as long as he's got daddy on his side, everything's going to be all right. Just keep fighting. Just keep fighting. It's going to be good. And then the last story is this. It closes. I, I just can picture when Jesus was in the garden right before the crucifixion. And 
I, I believe, I know that, that Jesus, he, he didn't come to this world. He was just like you and me. He came to this world with a dream and a mission and a purpose. But I believe that he knew what he had to do. But I don't think he knew exactly when. I knew he knew that it was coming. I can't prove this. It's just what I believe. But I don't think he knew that the time was now until that moment in the garden. And you see, Jesus, we all know he was flesh. He hurt like we hurt him. And he, and, and he fought like we fought with all the temptations that we had. But he could have saved us from everything if he didn't, be, if he wasn't tempted or he didn't go through everything. But I just believe that, you know, if, if you, again, if you could use your holy imagination, I just believe that here he is in his ritual prayer. And he's praying to his daddy, God, and he hears him say, hey, now is the time. And he said, what? Now? I, mean, I like it here in the South. They got some good food in the South. Fried chicken and watermelon, man. For real, now? The reason why I believe that is because I think even Jesus himself knew the, how powerful the call was to get up on that cross and to echo his name. That he hit that moment to where he didn't, he kind of wanted to, he didn't want to give up. He just didn't want it to be right then, you know. It's like, man, just give me a few more days to gain my strength, you know. To get prepared for this. But God was like, no, now. And he came to the point, you all know the story, where it literally, the doctors have proven to the highest point of stress your body can literally doesn't know how to react other than sweat drops of blood. And so you can't tell me that Jesus wasn't in a moment to where he didn't face the having to go back to his own basics of to keep on fighting because he knew the sole purpose that he had to carry out was to make a statement that would echo his name across the world. But he, why did he do it? Because he knew he had a daddy God was on his side that would never leave him and never forsake him. Guys, I'm here to tell you, stay in the fight. God doesn't put you through a fight and give you just enough ammo to get you through it, but he gives you more than enough to get the victory. A boxer doesn't go into a ring expecting not to get hit. It's just how he responds when he gets hit. And things are going to get tough. Keep on fighting. The job is to echo his name. Faith places no limitations on God, and God places no limitations on faith. Whatever you believe to do, you can do it. Keep it on. And this is what I want to leave you with. This is the foundational scripture of this series that we're going to reenact throughout the next three weeks. Colossians 2, 6 through 7. Please listen. Is that my counsel for you is simple. It's in the message. My counsel for you is simple and straightforward. Just go ahead with what you've been given. You received Christ Jesus, the master, now live him. You're deeply rooted in him. You're well constructed upon him. You know your way around the faith. Now do what you've been taught. School's out. Quit studying the subject and start living and let your living spill over into thanksgiving. Amen? In other words, our purpose in life is to live the life that he's called us to do, and that's to echo his name. Echo his name around this world. I want you all to bow your heads and close your eyes.